support, and certainly want to say thank you all for coming today. Well, as we all can count on the calendar changing to a new year a few, a few days ago, we can count on the entire marketing club to bring this luncheon to you, and by courtesy of Bruce Beagle, who kindly gives up his time, effort, and his team's effort in preparing a dynamite presentation. Uh, this is me, Bruce. Bruce is eight here and doing this for the club. In our communication, we talk about that uh, this event is by far the single largest event that the club has from the luncheon series. So we welcome uh, all of you here today, and we welcome Bruce. If I may, just give you a little background. At Winterberry Group, Bruce Beagle has led more than 200 engagements over the past 14 years, serving a wide range of marketers, agencies, direct and digital marketing service providers, and many other private equity firms who invest in this sector. Among others, those included assignments are Axiom, Burlington, East Circle, Capital One, City, DMG, and the list goes on and on. Quite an impressive list. Bruce is a DMCNY Silver Apple and Melbourne Leader Award winner. And he currently serves as a member of the Data and Marketing Association's Leadership Council, the Education Advisory Committee on Direct and Digital Marketing, as a judge on the annual DMA Innovation Award and the SIAC Cody Awards. I could go on, but I think it's time to bring Bruce up here. And if I laugh, I'd like to ask all of you to help welcome me and a warm welcome to Bruce Beagle. But it's becoming less important. 
because it's now a fact of life. It's no longer oh, look, it's not fact. It's part of our everyday life. Traditional media is still held on, um, with a couple of exceptions. It wasn't as good for some of the traditional side. So, GDP growth. The reason we think about GDP growth is because Mary Meeker, who wants to come from this working center, taught us that if you look at GDP and you multiply it times two, that's about where that's going to be. So, we had GDP growth of about 2.4%. In the last quarter, still just under 2% for the year. It was kind of soft by historical standards, but what was the impact on that? Well, GDP growth, advertising spend, as opposed to dollars. So ad spend increased far more. Yes, the Olympics definitely helps, the election definitely helps, but we had a pretty big growth. And we went from 327 billion of spend to 347 billion. It's a big industry. And each year we go back and we look and say, are there segments of the marketing world that we're not including in our numbers? So we try to get a little bit better. So this year the numbers you know, are a little bit different, but we're looking at three pies instead of two. So when we break down that 347, digital advertising captured almost $74 billion. Um, offline US media marketing at 147 and traditional at 125. When I started doing this, the first one was bigger than the others. And has slowly, slowly, slowly declined. Um, offline has kept its share, but money that is just, as new money has come in, it has come into digital. So let's take a look. TV held its own last year. You know, it continues to grow. Obviously, when you have big events, that require mass, like an election, like a, you know, Olympics, you have soccer tournaments, et cetera, TV gets a big boost from that. You know, probably there's, there's about 40 billion out of that 70 billion. That's just kind of rock solid mass advertising before it kind of starts to break down. Outdoor, cinema, held its own. Cinema tickets have been going up. I don't think that's advertising. Um, we thought it would subsidize some, but it doesn't work that way. Radio, a little flattish, but radio's really not fine. It's been right in this range of 14, 15 billion, rounded up three or four years now. Newspapers, 12, 15, 9, which was a bigger drop than we expected in 8.2%. And for those who heard this before, when we started looking at this in 2006, the newspaper was $46 billion. So $30 billion walked away. And what did it just disappear? It didn't go away. It just moved. And magazines also went from the mid 20s down to about $16 billion. So this is a continuous, steady decline of trend. Because media consumption on digital sites is going up. In the offline world, the categories we added this year were shopper marketing and sponsorships. Now, in the sponsorship category, so everything was free. Shopper marketing needs to grow. You know, e-commerce is growing, Amazon is growing, all the news you hear is about that. We also talk about it a little bit later. It's not just that. So shopper marketing, getting to people in the store, and we have taken the digital part of that out. So this is just traditional shopper to get to that number. It's still growing, and it's growing nicely. Sponsorships is still predominantly, and you know, maybe I'll ask you, we went back and forth internally, Count this, don't count this, about 60, 70% of sponsorship is around sports and entertainment. So that's where the big dollars go. So the question is, should we keep it in? Should we continue to track it? Show of hands, keep it in, take it out, don't care. All right, we'll keep it in. So sponsorships will stay in. We're working on looking at that, which is also a little squishy in terms of the numbers. Sometimes the numbers just aren't there and you just can't get under them. And if we don't have any confidence, we're going to throw them away. Teleservices continue to grow, whether it's sales, services, support, et cetera. That is not going away. As much as everybody lives online, there's no sales problem. Um, and direct mail. Direct mail went up. After a year of going down, direct mail returned to growth last year. Um, we've tried to normalize our numbers for fourth quarter to revert out to the number that's early, earlier than the post office reports back. So 
So our numbers have always been a little guesstimate on the fourth quarter, so we try to get a little bit more accurate this year. But we really think that direct mail that could year and from talking to the production players in the industry, they, are, they saw a very strong fourth quarter. So, so we're confident that direct mail hasn't lost anything and is in fact starting to turn the growth. Is teleservices in the industry? What industry is what? What industry is the direct mail go up? I'm not talking about direct mail yet. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I will get to that in a moment. Somebody had a question on teleservices. Teleservices question? Yeah, does teleservices include customer service as well as sales? <laughs> it's customer service as part of the sale process. So it's not 100%. <coughs> and the outsource portion of that number is roughly half. So half of that is in source, half of that is out source. Um, in the data world, so what the thing at the core that's driving so much of this change, our data number comes in at about 11.8 billion. Direct mail related data continue to see compression on the pricing side. And even though volumes are up slightly, spend is down. But it didn't mean marketing databases run very well. We're seeing money move in. And one of the things that's driving email data spend up is that database portion of it. Building email databases, cleaning email databases, <coughs> hygiene. So we saw a big boost in email, but it's still pretty small. Obviously, the big change was in digital data spend. So when you start to add in data management platforms, the growth of onboarding services that we reported this year, now that's business that went from 125 million to 250 that we see continuing to double. So we're getting new types of data, first party, second party, third party applications. So the data market itself, <laughs> data market itself grew about 4%, which was pretty good. But again, this is a, this is a core driver of many of the other things that we'll talk about. So how do you do? Um, we were off a little bit on the traditional media advertising because we overestimated or underestimated the decline of the newspaper. On offline media marketing, um, we thought direct mail would be a little bit bigger. We thought we'd see a little bit more growth, but we still got growth. And where we missed probably the most, the biggest is for us was display. The amount of money that's going into display just keeps growing at an exponential rate. Now, when we talk about display, it's display via mobile device or desktop. So, and if you're doing display on a social media site, that's counted in display, not in social media. So we pull where display is back into display to get to our numbers, which is a little bit of an art, but if you kind of look across enough places, you, you generally can pull that back in. But display spend keeps growing. All right, U.S. direct mail volume spend. You know, so we started, we started to see, and it was really around this, the back half of the year, not so much the first half of the year, volume started to tick up. The biggest growth rate was in actually catalog. Catalog had a lot of impact on direct mail this year as we started to see returns of catalog volume. <coughs> Financial services, insurance, were also big players among the verticals. Um, but nonetheless, we started, you know, after being flat or slightly up, we came down, now we're coming back up a little bit. Okay, so that catalog thing, the other thing that we think about in direct mail, we have new entrants, companies like Double Post and Cohere One that are coming to the market that are doing digital direct mail or programmatic direct mail which is really trigger mail based off of retargeting. So it's, it's taking a lot of principles from variable data, but having new data, and really using the online as that trigger. And we're starting to see more of this. And you know we're gonna see how that grows, but I think it makes a lot of sense, whether it's done on a one-to-one -one basis or a small batch basis to segment. Because you have to be very, um, you have to have a good understanding of where the privacy boundaries are. TV spend, obviously up. In TV spend, the thing we're watching is addressable TV. Addressable TV came in to about $900 million last year. And that's the ability to look at that set-top box and deliver that one-to-household experience. It's 
not one to one, because the TV is a shared device unless you have really big pockets. Um, but the spend doubled year over year. The household coverage doubled, and I'll talk more about this in a little bit. Email, everybody, you know, we sit in this room and we open our emails on our mobile devices. We are not carrying around our desktops, our laptops, etc. Um, the other thing is we saw a lot more format flexibility on the email side, but email continues to be and is ever more important within the mix. Even though the spend on email is still so small, it has an outsized impact on what people do. It's only because most media channels you pay for the look of media and email mode is close to free. Can you say that again? In the email world, delivery is close to free. So therefore, it doesn't have the same cost of a package of direct mail, or the cost of production on a catalog, or the cost of media that you get in advertising and display. Um, in display, speaking of that, programmatic continue to gain share. Um, so the programmatic buying approach is now at about 60 We've watched that, we're tracking that now five years. That's down from 30 to 60. It's doubled over the last five years. Now, we've heard 100% by 2020. I don't know if we get there, but it will continue to grow. It's as much about the efficiency of buying programmatically as it is about auction and real-time bidding. Because a significant portion of programmatic is still direct negotiated and executed programmatically as opposed to auction. And obviously in some of the auction exchange environments, there are still some challenges with quality <coughs> investment. They're not always as good, but the market keeps moving forward. Um, the other big thing that we're seeing in display is format flexibility. If you've noticed, the formats that are showing up on your computer, your phone, et cetera, are keep working. How do I get video to be look consistent when one device is this big, the next device is this big, the next device is that big? You know, we just all the different sizes. And should video be horizontal? Should it be vertical? You know, so kind of looking through, we're seeing a lot of format demand. So it's putting a lot of pressure on creative to be consistent. And I'll also talk more about that. Time spent on mobile, up another 7-8%. Um, but it's really inside the app. So as much as people are spending time on their phone, they're spending that time in Facebook, in LinkedIn, in Snapchat, in wherever. And it's more about the apps than it is mobile web, unless you're trying to find a parking garage in New York, in which case you quickly go to mobile web. Um, mobile ad spending, on an aggregated basis, went to $33 billion this year, you know, up 54%. You know, that tells you either we're just living on that phone or perhaps we have a lot more devices. And I will talk about the, the increase in the number of devices and how money is spent. Um, we also saw an increase in mobile search. Obviously, if you get mobile up to 33 billion and you got digital at 79 billion and you got search and display being the lion's share, both of those moved to mobile. But voice search accounted for more than one month. So voice search hit 20%. You say, oh, that's it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the, the technology, the, the artificial intelligence under, underpinning these new technologies are driving forward at an exponential rate. And so they actually can understand what you say more than they used to be able to. I'm not going to say they actually understand it, but it's certainly more than they used to be able to understand. But this is a trend that we expect to see continuing, that more and more will be done off the keypad. And I had some minor surgery on my hand earlier this month. And, um, and all of a sudden I was just there, and typing was problem. I was like, wow, wouldn't it be great if I could just do voice search right off my computer? And it's really, you know, I can go over to Siri, because Siri doesn't actually cut the form. Mm -hmm. So you have to you look and say, it will be nicer when you can just say, hello, Alexa, et cetera, get me. Other than get me dominoes, get me something I would. That is a little healthier. Um, another thing that we're watching in the social and, and the reporting attribution area, Facebook ad reports, Google Attribution 360, I think within the walled gardens, we're starting to see better reporting coming out. 
And this has been something that money has been continuing to shift, and I think Google and Facebook control somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of digital spend. You know, and the reporting has been kind of lame. So watching that come back and starting to give us more information about how we spend our money, hopefully more accurate information on how we spend our money, um, and more transparency will be helpful. The issue is they've got you know, as much scale as they have, it makes them a target for Congress, for the government, for regulation. And when you do that level of accurate att attribution and provide too much transparency, they will wind up in front of Congress. So they're playing a balancing act between those who pay their bills and those who could shut down their business. And I think, you know, as much as we would be like, why the hell can't they do this? The issue is they're, they're walking a tightrope. Um, digital video, you know, people are increasingly watching video on devices. 70% of U.S. internet users now go over the top. Sam, in fact, cut her cord this month, and she is no longer tethered to the cable company. Um, Amazon Prime, fastest growing over the top service. So when we think about video, how do we define those? Speaking to somebody, the other night, it's like we've got linear television, we have over the top, we have adjustable TV. Should we call it TV anymore? Or should we just think of it as this is video across devices? And the TV is just one more device. And whether it's adjustable or not, it's another device. So we're really watching how video and the consumption of video works. Um, 24% of marketers, this is my favorite stat, by the way. Consider their organization to be extremely data-centric today. 59% said so within two years, they will be extremely data-centric. This is my BS quote of the year. Now, if you want to talk about fake news, this is fake news. It's not that easy to do this level of transformation. You know, the good news is everybody's paying attention. The reality is Training your organization to think data first, to think about insights, is really hard, especially when we have some talent gaps. We have organizational design gaps. We have people who have been doing things one way for a long time, they're not ready to change. And there's just competing projects and competing priorities. So, yes, they are going to get there. No, they are not going to be, we're not going to magically go from 24% of extremely data centric to 59%. Yes, ma'am. Bruce, do you have any idea what that figure would have been a year ago? Probably the same. Everybody's aspirationally more data centric. Yeah. It's a good thing to do. It's been two or three years. I think I've been on the data thing for years. <laughs> but it keeps getting better. You know, the reality was that 24% was probably more like 12% three or four years ago. Okay. So organizations are getting better across the organization. Look, if you came from direct mail, you were already data centric. But it's as these digital channels started to mature, they had to become more data centric. You know, it wasn't, even though much of it came out of the media budgets, which weren't measured the same way, mm -hmm. and they're like, cool, we got all this really measurable stuff we can do. Their mindset had to change. And they had to learn to be direct marketers, mm -hmm. which is something that's not actually that easy, unless you've been doing it for a while. Um, but within that, though, we are watching DMP adoption up to about 50%. Data management platforms that are helping you manage anonymous users and anonymous visitors increase significantly on boarding. I'll talk about more later. But I don't, you know, when we look at that 50% number, if I look at the entire enterprise and the market segment, we are not at 50%. It doesn't bottom up the way it should when you can look at it. That's an interesting number. But people who fill out the surveys, 50% of those people are, have implemented DMP. And we think that over the next couple of years, DMP penetration will continue to grow exponentially because if you want to manage the segments of your audience that are unknown in a privacy compliant way, it's an important tool. It's not the only important tool, but it's a very important tool. And there are enough DMPs that either they're part of platforms or they're standalone that people have choice both in capability and in pricing. 
and the agency services landscape. So this is a little bit of a busy slide. Um, we built this on a studio presentation to about 130 agency CEOs back in November. And we started to take a look and said, what's different between 2010 and today? One, we have more segments of agencies. So you have direct agencies, media agencies, creative agencies, digital agencies, product design agencies, etc. But we have two new groups that are now part of the agency world. We have management consultancies, the Baines, McKinsey's, etc. We have system integrators, the Accenture's, Deloitte's, the IBM's, who have also come in and they go, oh yeah, look, $360 billion, I want some of that. That's a very big number. And we're done with do, redoing HR, we've done accounting, etc. And we've seen the rise of these system integrators, um, technology consultancies coming into the market. So when we think about what's happening in the agency world, we see the technology guys coming over from the CTO's office, <coughs> the management consultants coming down from the CEO's office, all kind of zeroing in on that CMO. And CMO has to talk to friends. But where the CMO can say, look, I have my working media budget. I need to get this stuff done. The CTO says, my friends over here at Accenture Deloitte, et cetera, et cetera, have taken care of me for a long time. I feel comfortable with them, except they don't really know what they should know about doing this work. So there's this kind of conflict of, yes, they want to be in, and are they, you know, not that many McKinsey consultants actually were marketing practitioners. So there's a, a gap in, in that real knowledge of how to do it at the brass tacks level. Um, nonetheless, an enormous amount of money is being spent as they enter this market. Other things that we're seeing, creative media were separate. They were blown up about 10, 15 years ago because the theory was media, if we don't have creative and strategy, doesn't have conflict of interest the same way. Now, when we move from conflict of interest issues and we separate the two, we're in a good place. Today, as media has become more programmatic, it's forcing it back together. Because when I've got so many versions and I'm trying to do personalization and I've got so many media channels, having creative outside of that room and creative just kind of coming over the transit doesn't work. So Havas was a leader in this. We're seeing Google Assist do this. Martin Sorrell just started to talk about this for WPP. We're starting to see some of these segments come back together that were blown apart with the agency structure. So we saw a lot of change in the, in the market in a lot of ways. Um, speaking of agencies, um, 127 deals out of 318 agency um, marketing deals were digital agency last year. So with those consultancies and the whole coast, they are continued to buy digital because digital is growing. And digital agencies have also realized being a standalone digital agency in an omnichannel world is a really tough place to be. So a lot more consolidation, but whole coast, and right after those, the consultant firms underneath. Now, there's a drop in the bucket. There were 3,000 M&A tra transactions tracked at Betsy Brunet last year. Digital media commerce, one of the big buckets, $72 billion. Um, it's $170 billion M&A market. It's really big. But when we kind of look underneath the service, underneath it, digital advertising, agency marketing services, you know, it's all consolidated. And we aren't seeing any slowdown in that at all. And it definitely impacted our business. We did more diligence assignments for private equity firms and strategic buyers in the back half of the year you know, than we'd ever done in a, in a, in a time frame, even going back to 07, 08 at the, at the last top. So activity has been pretty hot. All right, trends to watch this year. We'll start with digital media consumption. Okay, this, I don't know if we need to talk about it that much anymore. We think the time spent on devices over the next year or so. I think we're done. There's only so much time you can spend on <coughs> watching TV. And, and you know, there's, if we're just getting the limit the media consumption itself. Where are they consuming that media? Um, the implication for marketers on this is how do I design for a cross-device experience? 
where people are going to consume my content. They may see it on the TV, then they're going to see it on their tablet, then they're going to see it on the phone. It needs to be consistent, and that is a fairly big creative challenge, and we're, that's a theme that we're running across, but it's also a big data challenge. But it also says we start, to, you know, we need to crack the silos. You can't have a social group over here, and a mobile group over here, and a digital group over here, and make all of this work across. It also says that when we think about campaign management platforms, I need them to manage more channels for me. Because it's going to pull from that creative asset management repository, it's going to pull from my marketing databases. I don't want to pull any of the three systems that are disconnected, or four systems or five systems. I need that to pull from the same place so that we, so I can report and so I can do attribution. This intersection of devices, geolocation, and behavioral data. So billions of location data points. You know, everything we're hearing right now is people are saying, okay, I will allow. I will allow you to track my location. But otherwise, it doesn't work particularly well. I will allow you to track my location for maps where they don't work very well. So people are giving permission for that information. I'm going to allow Starbucks to, to tell me where that new Starbucks, you know, the, the closest Starbucks. I think Sarah, you came up and, and we're walking up the street. My daughter's here with me today. Um, and she's I was like, she wants to go to Starbucks. Where? She goes, there's one 200 feet away on 4th and 3rd and Madison, and I'll see you back at the Yelp Club. You know, but it is that allowability that is allowing all of these location data points to be collected. Now, when I take location data from mobile, and I have all the location data from the Internet of Things, and whether it's beacons or watches or whatever, you start to build a profile and you start to be able to target about where somebody is, not just what they're doing, where they are at a moment in time, so time and location and device becomes very, very important. And the ability to recognize people, where they are, when they are in that moment of their customer journey, is absolutely critical. And so we're starting to see this expansion of device traps tied back to the individual, no longer tied back to the household. You know, because I care about you, not necessarily everybody in your house at the same time. I want to know that you are walking past my store or in my store. And it impacts loyalty and it impacts activation. Um, and you need to be able to activate against this. So the marketers are sitting there going, so this database platform, these campaign management tools, our marketing planning is this really designed for that environment, whether it's campaign based or always on. Am I designing for it? Am I planning for it? Do I have the right things in place? On the supplier side, being able to recognize somebody. The identity management and the resolution of identity across devices becomes the key. If you can't do this, you can't do personalization. So it's that confluence of now we've got data, what do we do with it? That matters a lot. In the social world, there are a lot of things to think about in social, but what we saw last year was the rise of influencers. You know, everybody's talking about how do I get on board with influencer marketing? Whether they're good or bad influencers, they are influencers, they have an audience. We need to either buy these influencer talent agencies, hire one of them, do it ourselves. We're not really sure what to do, but we do know that it's giving us lift in sales. So all our metrics that we're tracking are saying that it's giving us a 2x boost. So we guess this works. Um, and so we're starting to see influencer agencies. Because we didn't have enough agencies in that little band before. We need influencer agencies. They will get gobbled up. And they'll either fall into social agencies, PR agencies, or integrated agencies, or digital agencies. But they will not last as a, as a standalone group for very long. Um, the, the challenge is, what should I pay? What is the value of an influencer? Because some will say, oh, yeah, you know, give me a half a million bucks to go drive that car, and I'll be your influencer. Is that really what you should be paying? It's not that they don't have an audience, but really, is that the way to do it? And of course, the FTC is really looking for some paying attention you know, to how 
these people are compensated, how they are, just how you disclose. Um, but we really start to see this as a having a big impact on the social universe. They are, in effect, new publishers. Programmatic and creative, we kind of took a look and said, okay, is this, you know, content was a new black three years ago, and I got up here and said, you know, is this a black hole? 90% of campaigns don't have any creative. We are all talking about personalization, but how do we do dynamic creative optimization? How do I do one-to-one -one creative in a consistent way across all of these devices? This is not an easy thing. It's forcing brands and their agencies to rethink how creative is produced and what is the cost of personalization. Having four million, if I got four million customers, should I have four million offers? Should I have four million, you know, colors? You know, how do I put this together in a way that matters? Um, they're really struggling with this. They're also struggling with whom should I use? Should I do this inside? Should I go to a publisher who's got a content agency? Should I use my regular agency? Who's going to create that best message and put it out there? Um, I don't think we're ready from a process standpoint to deal with this. Um, and I don't think we're ready from a format standpoint. So I think it's not a black hole, but it's a real challenge to the industry. I think as we get better, as that 24 becomes 59% in terms of data center, this is something that has to be solved to make that data work. Otherwise, it won't be worth the cost. Because I can make, you know, I can do personalized one-to-one -one with the greatest same for everybody. Am I really doing personalized one-to-one? -one? Or am I just saying, I know you're great? Uh -huh. um, digital shopping, e-commerce sales grow by 16% to $460 billion. That's a pretty good number. E-commerce has been rising year over year over year. Almost all of us shop at some point online. Um, is it putting stores at risk? It's putting some sectors of stores. But remember, we have a five trillion dollar retail economy. We're now getting ten percent point. So while it is impacting stores, it's impacting how we think, how we research, etc. It's impacting digital shopper marketing and the growth there for sure. So it's forcing us to think better. But we're not replacing stores anytime soon. It's still 10%, and even at the best forecast, you know, maybe we get to 15% by 2020. So it's a long road of online and offline marketing. And being able to price consistently, to have flexibility in offers, to build loyalty, to recognize customer in the store, we think shopper marketing's got real promise, both in the traditional offline side, as well as in the digital environment. And attribution is not easy. Addressable TV. Does it matter what screen you are watching? So, big breakout year, spend double. The forecast is to reach $20 million by 2020, which would be about you know 25% of all spend, maybe 30%, 25% of all spend at that point in time. Things that are holding this back, you know, we had a big increase in the number of households that were addressable. We got to about 50 million, but there are about 120, 112, 120 million households in the US. We don't have coverage yet. So being able to do addressable at scale and across all of geographies isn't there. But every brand that we spoke to is testing. In some way, they've gone out and said, I'm going to, whether it's a little test or it's a big test. I was reading the, uh, an article yesterday about CES, and they were interviewing the CMO from Renault, the car, the car manufacturer. He said, by 2019, he expects 100% of their TV advertising to be done addressably. It will vary in terms of, of how they get there based on country, but auto's always been a leader in looking at addressability, and we know the money's going to shift. We believe that out of that $70 billion of TV that's out there, roughly half could become addressable, as opposed to mass makes more sense. And we don't need to spend the money on the data technology to buy to be addressable. 
So think of a lot of the sponsorship money that goes in and things like Super Bowl ads and big event. You know, that money is not going to move into the addressable category. But if you think about a market that, that just hit 900 million, that could go to whether it's 20 million or 30 billion dollars, that's some pretty big ups. How does and that's it, a whole lot of data. How does addressable work since most of us aren't exposed to it and still a niche medium? So think about the set top box and the data that's within that. It knows at the remote level and at the box level what you watch, when you watch. And you can go and replace that local insertion. So the local cable operator gets a certain number of pods that they can swap out. So instead of swapping it out where everybody in that cable system gets the same ad, I can have a digital insertion based on your set-top box ID tied back to your household ID, which in a nice privacy plug way, of course. Um, <laughs> which says, okay, this household has these behaviors, send them this version of this auto ad, as opposed to that version. We know that they live in, in this zip plus four, or we know that they, we know a lot of things about them. Still at the segment level, it's gonna be built, as opposed to the individual level, because of privacy issues. But it's, it's a track that goes from the media planner buyer, down to the cable system, typically using some sort of safe haven environment for the data, because we don't want to put all that data back up, and then you can execute the buy at the personal level. Does that set-top box level data include DVR recordings? Yes. They know lots of things about what you do. You talk to the cable systems, they know what you watch, when you watch. If you, if you notice, you know, just leave the TV on, don't change the channels all of a sudden, you know, up will pop something. And of course, since that same router is routing digital through that set-top box, they're now starting to see, you know, what are you doing over the top versus what are you doing on the set-top box. You can also look at the TV sets and their collective data, some of whom have gotten in trouble for how they collect data without permission. Um, but I think there'll be a little bit more privacy compliant around it. But if you were to work with somebody like DirecTV, fabulous opportunities to be able to do addressable at scale in the direct TV of the dish ecosystem. Excuse me, uh, you said there's 50 million addressable, there's 120 million overall. Uh, why is that? Why is, the, why is there a gap? So one is the number of households, that's a bigger number. The smaller number is it takes time for these cable systems to link, to change and upgrade their the technology, I'm very technical. The technology at their head end, where they connect out to the homes and they broadcast signals, that has to be upgraded. And the ability to collect the data, analyze the data, format the data, put it in a way that you can now match it in a safe data environment, it's taking time. There are somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 or 500 cable systems in this country. Not all of them are named Time Corner. Comcast and Verizon, but it gets very, very fragmented after you get through the big three. So it's, it's just going to take a while. Okay. I, I watch Apple TV a lot. You know, I've got my shows that I like to see. You know. And um, I watch Hulu. I don't, I don't see a lot of advertising. Why is that? Because right now they're still figuring out the ad model on the TV. And so should I have an in-stream advertisement? Well, I have, since it is a paid subscription service, typically it's being, it's being subsidized by your subscription fee and not by the advertisements. So different pricing model. Okay. But there will be versions, and so in many, think about digital radio, you have free versions with ads, you have paid versions without ads. So depending on your paying, you're paying for the right, perhaps, not to have an advertisement. Okay, the internet of everything. So, we've got 10 billion connected devices expected to reach $25 billion. 25 billion devices. Everything that, that we've been hearing, you know, about voice control, about Alexa, Google Home, um, Siri, one of these, or all of these, will become the center of how you talk to your home. You know, whether it's cameras in your fridge so you can look at what's in the fridge, much less barcodes, et cetera, that get scanned and captured. 
it's your thermostat in your home, it's your car. You know, they are putting sensors and devices that all can report back and get connected to an app that can be managed. This is an unbelievable amount of data. Connected home brand searches up 240%. We actually got Alexis for everybody on our team at Winter Ferry at, at the holiday because it's not optional for us to know what's going on and to see how this evolves. And when I was looking at Google Home versus Alexa, it came down to Google Home didn't have Bluetooth connectivity so that we could have better audio listening experiences. <laughs> and so that was the deciding factor because a lot of people stream music. And, and that Bluetooth connectivity and Apple had, a, uh, sorry, Amazon had a far bigger device route that they were connected to and that they could control and speak to today. Google, on the other hand, guess what? They do a better job in search. <laughs> so, you know, when you start to think about all these devices, how do you think about loyalty? And what is the impact of connecting all your devices so that you can talk to them, control them, et cetera, on your brand if you are in home and on loyalty. So we think it's, it's that side. How do you make sure somebody's really happy with, with what you're putting in the house? Um, it's also, every one of these devices is yet another advertising platform. Yeah. As we start to think about this continuous fragmentation, the internet of everything is a massive advertising opportunity and nightmare all at once. Um, but it's not going to go away. It's going to increase in adoption. Um, the first thing that we have to think about is how do we get insight from data? Forget activation, forget ad channels. What is the, the information we're pulling back? How are we going to pull the insights? Because from that, it will help to determine the direction of a lot of our advertising. And of course, when you think about campaign management tools, all right, it's great. I can do phone, I can do tablet, I can do desktop, I can do watch, I can do fridge, I can do whatever I think I'm going to be able to do. How, what you, what's the impact of formats on all that? You know, what, what format should the ad be if it's going to be on my fridge or in my fridge? I don't really know the answer yet. So creative, big challenge, right on top of all the other creative challenges that I've talked about. Um, AI and machine learning. So about a billion dollars was invested last year. I've already seen another $150 million worth of announcements in the first two weeks of January into AI shops that are doing artificial intelligence and machine learning. On the other side, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Uber, Salesforce all bought machine learning startups and AI startups. They know their platforms have to get smarter. It's not just about Watson or Einstein I was joking with a client the other day, and it's like, how come you didn't name your AI technology after a dead smart guy? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's a bad branding exercise. You just have to find the right dead smart guy to name your stuff after, and you will have brand success. Um, but the use cases that we're seeing, it's everything from diagnostics to sales, service, marketing, it's chatbots, it's how do we provide smarter, interactions with our customers, with our prospects, wherever they are, on whatever device, without having to hire 25 million people. Because we don't want to do all of this manually, and we've got to keep the cost under control. So AI is something that, that's really, really critical on the go forward. But benchmarking is uh, really good. Even understanding the definitions between AI and machine learning, et cetera, is hard. Having enough people in analytics, who can actually understand why this, use this, is really a challenge, or really a challenge, rather. Um, and we really don't know the impact on data consumption, because these things live on data. The more data we have, the more work they're going to do, the more data they're going to want. As they learn, give them more data. And of course, the internet of everything is going to give us more data. So it's really interesting to watch. But you know, you just have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. Again, it's an area that's moving a little bit faster than the people trying to figure out what to do with it. Recognition, identity management, and the rise of data onboarding. Okay, so I've talked about personalization. In under, in, in able to do personalization, 
you need to do recognition. In order to do recognition, you need to do identity management. It's a fairly linear thing. You know, you can't skip a step in there. I can't do personalization without recognition. I can't recognize how I personalize the experience. When we did our study on onboarding that we released in December, which is up on our website, um, we watched onboarding spend double in the last year or every year. And onboarding is I am taking information, typically first party information that you own, I am matching this information to a digital identity, whether that's an ID, whether that's coming from a device, or that's a cookie type of match. But I am now linking that, stripping away personally identifiable your name, et cetera, your address, and leaving that information in so I can recognize you by this ID. So it's anonymized information. We've watched this, you know, it started with LiveRamp, we watched it grow, we saw it at Newstar, we've seen it in other places. But this market is growing very rapidly. And the reason is I need to be able to provide personalized one to one marketing in an anonymized environment. Direct mail never had to do this, it didn't have to live there. So when we think about this market, the number of customers doubled, the amount of spend doubled, we expect us to keep doubling this to be the next billion dollar data market. So we're pretty bullish on it. Um, the implication is if I need to do recognition, personalized one to one marketing, this is going to be part of my story. A DMP does not do this. A DMP can be part of this process but it's not the answer by itself. So, how does this all work? I'm doing a little tutorial here. Take the CRM data, you can either run it through your database services provider, or you can take it directly to an onboarding provider, depends on the sophistication of your shop and what you want to do. Um, you could or could not use a DMP, and then once that data has been onboarded and matched, you can now push it, push it out into the digital ecosystem, use or you can use it on yourself. So you have a couple of options on how you want to do that. And you can now reach people across locations, across devices, over time, those that you don't already have a personal relationship with. Obviously, if I've already got your email address and I've got a dollar with you, I don't need to onboard for that. But for those who are not my customers, who I do not have all of that permission, you know, maybe I want to do look like modeling and match against those. The use cases that we're seeing, digital display targeting, most mature because this is where it got started. Wall guarding, wall guarding targeting. So think Facebook custom audiences, Twitter custom audiences, etc. These are also fairly mature. People are getting used to the notion of I'm going to upload my CRM data or my prospect list, etc. I'm going to either do a lookalike or a match. It goes behind the firewall. I don't get all the impression information back that I would like but I know it's reaching my audience. Consumer analytics and, and insights still emerging. People starting to look and say, now that we can see them across devices and across um, different platforms, we have a better handle on behavior than we did before. So let's start to pull that in. Attribution is a primary use case. Site per personalization. Something, you know, showing that right off to the right person before they authenticate on the site. This is something that we see in obviously addressable TV. Analytics and measurement. Will this be the year of attribution? Not yet. <laughs> We're getting closer. You know, it's at the top of everybody's wish list, but we've got this huge talent deficit. You know, Mike Harrison, one of our MDs, works with SMU on, on their analytics group. They say, he said there's about a 300,000 person deficit in, in terms of talent versus open positions. You know, investment in automating solutions is growing 3x. So the money's there, the talent's not there. This is hard, but it's getting better. We've seen some things that are emerging from companies. I was at Flash Talking the other day, um, looking at their platform. They're doing a really interesting job of fractional attribution. But more importantly, 8% of the time spent doing attribution measurement is spent getting the data ready to do something. Right. And they're starting to automate, oops, they're starting to automate that process. To do that cleansing, do that hygiene, 
so that it's ready for the analysts. So they spend more time doing analytics and less time data wrangling. So we're starting to see progress with them and, and with others. So we're not there yet. We will probably be doing this, you know, maybe 2018, maybe 2019 will be the year of attribution. But we're getting better. Incrementally getting better every year is important. Ad tech, mark tech, something that people ask about all the time. What's the difference in the cares? <laughs> where does one end and the other one begin? And, and probably the, the, the clearest example, we were working on our RFP for brand, and they're like, well, we have our media agency, and they're responsible for you know, buying all the media and doing all this. Then we have our digital agency, and they're, and they're doing campaign management services for us. They're running things on the site. And we're like, OK, so where does your targeting fit? It's going to be driven by the data. It's coming off the site. Is that the responsibility of the people managing the site or your media people? The media people said that's ours. The site people said it's ours. Who cares whose it is? It's part of the ecosystem. But the difference, the difference, as we move to one to one, starts to go away. And there's a recognition among the tech vendors that it doesn't matter. So they're starting. We're seeing e-commerce companies partner with affiliate companies. We're seeing DMPs and e-commerce platforms bought by Salesforce. So we're seeing a lot of this integration occurring. We're also seeing the rise of system innovators who can figure out how to make all these systems work together. All right. I talk about the agencies and how things are compressing, so I don't really have to keep going on. Other than price competition intensifying. So there is pricing pressure given the new entrants in the market. And how do you infuse digital and data and creative in a consistent way across the agency? Um, and finally, M&A. All signs that we are seeing right now point to more. In, an un, in a less regulated environment that has been promised, we will see more M&A activity, especially as we continue to be in low interest rate. If people start to say, well, the economy is going to heat up, interest rates will go up, the cost of money goes up, we're going to see that change. And finally, accountability, fraud, and other things that we think about. Bots and frauds, methbot, um, fake videos, fake ad views, ad blocking, inaccurate performance reporting at Facebook, Snapchat, the agencies, etc. You know, so as marketers seek to invest, are they getting their money? Are they getting the value for the money they think they're getting just because the reports are saying that? And this is a new problem for, for the supply side of the industry. Everybody from the data companies to the agencies to the media companies have to get better at this. All right, outlet 17. So this is our first fake outlet. <laughs> you know, in, in honor of what's going on, we have fake numbers that we made up <laughs> this week. We're going to have fake consumers that we panel. We have fake publishers that we work with. And of course, there'll be fake metrics to report out. Um, Economic growth acceleration should boost spend. Will it grow 6%? Probably not, but we, we think that we get to about $364 billion. There's a big dependency. There's a wild card in the White House. We don't know what he's going to do. We don't know what Congress is going to do. If we have a benign environment with slow, with reasonable growth and slow inflation, I think we're okay. We think that we get a slight uptick that traditional is pretty flat without the catalyst that will boost growth in that sector. So look for a little up, but if you're in print, look for more down. It's not going to stop anytime soon. In the personalized marketing segment, we're looking for another up here in direct mail. All signs point to up. We don't think it's a big up, but we think it's a good up. We think sponsorship growing, shopper growing, even teleservice is growing slightly. Of course, my favorite category is other. Other will be flat, because we don't know what's in other. There's some leftover money they can spend somewhere. OK, data. Nope, sorry. Digital, display, bigger than search this year. Still growing at a very high growth rate, at 20% on a bigger number. This would be damn good. So more money going there. Still more money going into search, and watch voice search very carefully. More money going into affiliate, into lead gen, et cetera. The bottom line is more money. To